Well, friends, back in 1956, some of you were not even the thoughts, but some of you were around in 1956. There's a man from Portland, Oregon, who had this urge and this desire in his heart to take the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted to take it to the Aka Indian tribe in Ecuador. His name is Jim Elliott. And he could have lived this comfortable life of just doing the normal routine and just not stirring up anything and kind of live the comfortable Christian life. But he said, no, I'm going to fight for this, and it's worth it to go down to this tribe that was known for killing people. There were oil workers that came down to work near these jungles, and all of a sudden arrows would come in, spears would come in, these guys were taken out. Nobody wanted to work near these tribes. And Jim's like, hey, four others, we should go down there because they don't know Jesus. Who's going to go there? He said, we're going to go there. So knowing the dangers, he went down there, and just a few days in, you can imagine the nerves as they landed this plane on the beach, and out of the jungles came these people that everybody's terrified of. They learned a few words that they could use. They're giving gifts, and they kind of had some relationships. A lot of you know where the story goes. All these missionaries were killed in the first week there, speared to death, left in a river. As search crews came in later, they found the red in the river, and they could see the bodies that were there. And so a lot of us think that's a really sad story. But I think about the, just the, the warriors in them, the, what I want to be like for Jesus, how they went down there and they shared the hope of Christ. And even Jim, he had a gun on him. He didn't use that gun because they didn't know Jesus. He didn't want them to have eternal separation from Jesus, so they took it. And today, a lot of you know the story, and there's a movie called Into the Spear. If you're looking for a good movie, find the movie called Into the Spear. It walks through the story. But today, a lot, most of these people in this tribe are Jesus followers now. A lot of the family members of these people, some of them actually live down there with them. But what is it for us in our Christian walk, why are we generally weak? As we see the decline in the church, even pre-COVID, the decline of the church, we're down to the lowest numbers we've seen and since uh, they've been measuring this back in the, I think, the 30s or 40s. Well, why are we generally known for, no, we don't want to share our faith because we might get a little nervous with that coworker. Might get a little bit of pit sweat, and this is my favorite shirt. The list is so long of, okay, why don't we want to do this? Okay, they might think I'm a creationist. I don't know how to defend all this stuff about creation. And we just go back and, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to show up to church and check a few boxes and just kind of play the game and, and do that route. Well, Jesus calls us to have a bold faith. So you serve the same God that Jim Elliott serves, the exact same God. As we're walking through this book of Joshua, we start today in this book of Joshua. We're not going to go through the whole book. And if you're not familiar with it, that's okay. We're here to navigate and, and help you. I'd like to just kind of tease you with books of the Bible, hopefully to whet your appetite. That way you can go back and you can study on your own. But friends, and again, if this doesn't make sense, it's okay. And Niani talked about it this morning. We want you to get in a small group so you can walk through the Bible with other people. And we can help learn together of what the Bible is talking about, how God has expressed himself to us. Well, friends, this morning as we walk through this, I can't help but think this whole week, I was so pumped for today because I'm thinking, what if there is one person here today, one person tuning in online that is ready to be bold for Jesus? No more excuses, no more sensitivity, bold for him. It doesn't mean to be rude, it just means to take a big step. You know what that step is for you because you know that family member, you know that coworker, you know that other student that doesn't know Christ. And you do. So you hold the key to share with them. Well, friends, our one thing for today, as, I, as you walk out of here today, I want you to know this as you leave the church this morning, as you leave the building. The one thing is that daring and disciple must go together. They're not separated. Daring and disciple must go together. So you can't have just one thing where, okay, we're over here, we're going to be We're going to be really daring. So we're going to be a little edgy, we're going to have these teeth, we're going to be just all in, we're going to be all about social justice, we're going to go out and do some, some philanthropy, we're going to be, do charitable things just for the sake of being good, to be a good person, conquer the world just to be good, but you know, don't dare share the Jesus part, just be good. I even hear this in some Christian circles today. I had someone tell me that they were embarrassed that we were a missionary in, in Eastern Europe because we were trying to teach people that their, their faith was not real, was not true. They said, how dare you go do that? I was thinking, would you go to an engineering school and tell them if they're thinking that 2 plus 2 is 8.5 and you say 2 plus 2 is 4, is that wrong? Like, this is true. Christianity is true. This is the truth. 
But there's some people that, okay, they just want to be daring, but not really in this whole discipleship thing. Then we have some other people over here on the other side. On the flip side, okay, they get discipleship. They think they understand discipleship. They're over here with discipleship. They think, okay, we're going to do the motions. We're a well-oiled machine in the church. We have this nice big uh, machine, the admin. We have this nice building. We have all these things, and we're ready to go to work, and we're ready to take charge and do what we need to do to make disciples. And we get out there, and we're ready to do work, and, well, things are working, Things are loud. We make a lot of noise as a church. There's no progress because something's missing in here, right? So friends, this morning, we cannot separate these two things. These two worlds have to go together. If you are a disciple, if you are a follower of Jesus, you must be daring. You cannot separate these two things. We're in a series called Who Is Your Josh? We started this last week, so if you missed last week, don't worry. I'm going to try to catch you up real quick here. I'm probably going to have to do a third of my sermon. I just have way too much in front of me. But the idea behind this is to see a mentorship between Moses and the Old Testament as he's getting older in age. He's the one chosen to lead the Israelites out, and then they're wandering. But he knew, we'll talk about this later, he knew he would not be the one to help the Israelites go into the promised land. So they're houseless, they're homeless, they're wandering forever. We get to see this mentorship as Moses poured into Joshua, poured into him. Let him see Moses' work in ministry in different contexts. He was there as his aide. Moses saw Joshua fighting. Joshua's like, I see something in you. There's extreme potential. Called him out. And so now we have the baton handoff as Moses comes to the end of his reign and he's nearing death. And so the idea in this is to be thinking about mentoring. Because last week we talked about if you are alive, you are a, let's try that again. If you are alive, you are a a mentor. Everybody has a mentor. Everybody has a mentee. So somebody is watching you, how you live your life. If you say you're a Jesus follower, someone's watching you, your every move. They even catch the things that you don't say. Back when I was working construction, Mark, you're different. Why did you not laugh at that perverted joke and why did you walk away from the crew? Mark, why are you not using profanity? You must be a Mormon. I've heard that a few times. No, I'm not a Mormon. But see, really, they're taking notes on the things we don't do as well, right? And also the things that we do. Well, friends, as we walk into the story of Joshua, I need you to enter the mindset of ancient times. It's so difficult for us. I know for myself, when I open the the Word of God and we go into these very old stories, and it's easy to think of this 2022 mindset of today where everything is now. We're in this culture of now. Everything's instant. I was even thinking this week, I'm like, it is, it's just a crazy age we're, living, we're raising our kids in and we're living in. Just to think that information is right there in our pocket. I mean, not too many decades ago, you know, they'd be laughing like, oh, you'll never have a calculator. You've got to figure out these equations. Well, guess what? And a flashlight. It's all in my pocket. And information to the whole world. This is a crazy crazy time that we live in. Well, friends, enter into this. I want you to visualize these scenes as we walk through the story of Joshua. I'm going to give you a visual here, too. This is a map to give you some context of where we are. So we're fast-forwarding about 40 years. So you have the Exodus. Israelites are leaving. They're wandering, wandering. So starting up there in the Nile Delta is where we began. This is the route of the Exodus. They went down south. So as a crow flies, this is really a significance of when you're obedient to God. Uh, usually things go well between you and him. Uh, someone had a, uh, there was, I saw a meme this last week of like a Strava map of the Israelites. If those of you have jogged or biked or walked, you do Strava. And it looked like a, a plate of spaghetti. That's pretty much what this looks Okay, so they went south all the way down Mount Sinai, going back up, wandering, wandering. So we finally get up to the far upper right corner. We're up in that region now. We're going to walk through some of these stories now as we're getting close to the promised land. Getting close. Well, Moses knows he's not going to be the one that's going to help them enter. We'll talk about why in a little bit, why he was not. But also in this too, and mentors, you don't have to do this with your mentees, but Moses named Joshua. He gave him a name. This won't be on the screens, but in Numbers 13, it talks about how it says this. He said, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. He gave him the name Joshua. So it's a sign of authority we see in Scripture, even in the, in the book of Genesis, when Adam has this authoritative leadership role of naming all the animals, and then he gives his bride a name as well. It's a sign of leadership. So Moses now showing the sign of leadership, giving Joshua a new start and a new name. Well, friends, as we look towards the New Testament, we see a lot of parallels with this too. 
Because we have a new Savior. Because the Hebrew version of Hoshea is really Jesus in the Greek. So as you fast forward to the New Testament, this is the meaning of Jesus as the ultimate Savior. So essentially, as we're studying the book of Joshua, isn't it cool that our Savior has a book named after him, found in the Bible? This is the story of Joshua, but Jesus is all over in the story. Well, let's dive right in, friends, just to go through this here. We're going to be in the book. That I will have this on the screen for you today. Um, so you just have to look this way, but you can also look at your own Bible if you have it. But we're in verse 1 of the first chapter of the book of Joshua. So it begins with this. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. I love that title. That's a title I would love to have. Servant of the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, and you all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Well, it's important to know, why did Moses die? Why was he not allowed to go in? And it goes back to disobedience. Maybe some of you remember the story. He was asked to speak to this, uh, to this rock and use his staff to beat this rock to get water out. And so God is very, very picky. <laughs> God wants obedience from us. We know the wages of sin are death. The wages of sin is death, my friends. So Moses now is suffering. Obviously, he was old as well. I heard someone say that. He was just an old guy too, right? We can't rule that out. But because of the fall, we have death. And aging and diseases happen. So now, Joshua, getting instructions to cross this river. Well, friends, I think at this point, Joshua is between like 58, maybe 60 years old. And for those of you who are in late 50s, early 60s, back then in biblical times, you would be a young buck. You'd have a bounce in your step. Life would be good. So Joshua, we think he was 19 or 20, somewhere in there when he started in the Exodus. Been learning for all these years, and now it is his turn to take the baton. So as you think about who is in your sphere of influence, who are you passing the baton on to? Parents, it's easy for us. We have our kids. But for the rest of you, maybe if you don't have kids, well, who is it for you? that you're passing the baton on to. Well, friends, let's skip down to verse 5 for the sake of time. It says this in verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And here's a command I love. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their, to their ancestors to give them. I love this command from God. Be strong and courageous. The key part here is God repeats this three times in this first chapter. Now, every word in here is important in God's, in God's word to us. But there's something of value when something is repeated over and over and over. It makes me think of like God is like grabbing Josh, <laughs> like grabbing his face like, hey, listen. Listen, be bold. Hey, Josh, right here. Listen. Be bold, be courageous, as he's looking around, you know, in his young age of late 50s. Focus, Mr. ADD, look at me. Be bold, be courageous, be strong and courageous. Well, friends, how many of you would change your plans tomorrow if you knew that God was with you and for you? If you realized that the full power of the spirit that dwelled in a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day to guide these Israelites, if that full spirit of the living God was in you, would you change your plans tomorrow? Think about that as you go back to work, as you do your day on your Monday. The full power resides in you if you believe in Jesus. Let that sink in. Well, friends, Joshua has his first assignment. In a few weeks, we'll talk about this as we'll talk about the crossing of the river. And we think that this river is maybe 100 feet across, 3 feet to 10 feet, but this is most likely the flood stage. So now Joshua's starting to think, okay, this is my assignment. We don't know how many people were there at this time. It could have been up to 2 million people. For those of you who lead at your work or lead your crews or your family, the 4, 5, 7, 8, 10 that you have, you know how stressful it is to guide them. Imagine being Joshua. Two million people out the door waiting for instructions. I would be a little bit like this. Be bold. Be courageous. We need to hear these things. Now, ownership of the land depended on God's faithfulness. 
but occupation of the land depended on Israel's faithfulness. They had to do their part. Well, friends, as we talk about this, I want this to come to a modern-day context. I want this to be a modern thing that you can understand is that daring and disciple, they must go together. So here he is as a follower of God of Abraham, the God of the Bible. He knew he had to be bold, but he needed some reminders. Well, friends, it's not easy. It's not easier in 2022 when the world feels like they're against us. If, they're, if you are a Jesus follower, I'm sure you feel like the world is against you. You scroll through social media for eight seconds, it looks like the world is against you. You look at news for five seconds, the world is against you. Why? Because you know the truth. And the enemy hates the truth. So if you hold that, expect some bumps on the road of life, friends. I want to encourage you with this, something to think about this morning too. If you live a life of fear, you will feel fear. If you live a life full of courage, you will feel fear. So if either way we're going to feel this fear, just be courageous. Just go for it. We're all going to have pit sweat. We all have things that make us nervous. You can't convince me on September 11th of 2001 when everyone's running this way, yet first responders go this way to, towards molten hot steel and thousands of tons of concrete with smoke billowing out of a building, they're running into it. You cannot convince me that they did not feel fear. If they didn't feel fear, well, then they're not courageous. If you don't feel fear, we just call that ignorant. Like they had to feel something. I, I know they were scared. That's why they're courageous. Yet God calls us as followers of him to be bold and courageous. So friends, just be courageous. And we want to hear from you too. If you take a step and you make a risk, uh, take a risk for Jesus this week, let us know. I'm not going to, you can tell me, I won't won't have to say it up front. We just want to pray for you and and know what you're going through with that coworker or that family member. Let us know as a church. Make sure to contact us. Well, friends, we all feel fear. I was thinking back this last week to a time in my life where I felt authentic fear. I was 19. When you're a 19-year-old male, you feel like, you're invincible, right? At 19, nothing can stop you. You have the world in front of you. So living in Oregon and on the left coast, uh, my buddy and I, Justin, we would go exploring the lands in Oregon on these different summers. And we'd like make these custom loincloths and just do weird things with signs in the middle of the desert that say, ask us, and sit there on lonely roads for half a day waiting for a car to go by and just do these weird things. And maybe one of us would cover ourselves with uncooked bacon. I don't know. We would do weird things because we're from Oregon. You've probably seen Portlandia. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> so we'd explore Oregon. we live off the land. And this one time, we, we came up to this cave in the middle of nowhere. This cave has this, this Masonic symbol on top of it. It's this hot lightning bolt. It's this humid day. We go in this cave with two flashlights, 22 revolver, fearless, two spears as well, ready for anything, loincloths on, bring it on. It's the deeper we get into this cave... As we see the glow of the day behind us fade, as the spots and the little molecules start going through the beam of the lights, we take a turn deep, probably 150 meters in this cave now. All of a sudden, we're starting to hear weird sounds, and this cave opens up and gets very big. The deeper we get into this cave, we see there are bleachers back in there, man-made. Then we see an altar in the back. And now we can't breathe because the molecules are so thick. We have to put our shirts over our faces. But then we decide to go back to back. Dude, you look over there. I'm looking over here. We're rotating. <laughs> Dude, are you scared? No, I'm not scared. Dude, keep rotating. I'm not scared. You scared? No, I'm not scared. Every scary movie I've ever seen came back in that cave. We kept going deeper and deeper. And we're just like, no, dude, I'm not scared. Ha, what was that? Nothing. No, I'm not scared. We get deeper into this cave. All of a sudden, it goes back. It opens up even more. There's this creek back there. Then there's this burial ground in there. And then we're like, you get to this point. We're no longer a 19-year-old male. I just feel like an infant. I want my mom to hold me and give me a bottle. <laughs> Where's mom? It's those moments. But you can fill in the blank. You've been in these freaky situations, whatever that is for you. As we slowly backed out of the cave, as you get the glow of natural light, <gasps> yes, you can finally breathe. The truck is still there. That was a fear. And you finally get out of this cave in the middle of nowhere. And I was reminded, no, we are still human. We all feel fear. But God has called us to do what he has called us to do, to be brave, to be bold and courageous. No excuses. Be strong and very courageous. Look at verse 7. He starts off in the same way. He says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful, listen to this, 
Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. You may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it. I love this. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then, then you'll be prosperous and successful. God here is saying, okay, yes, be strong and courageous. Be brave, be bold. He's not, saying to be, he's not really saying to be careless and reckless. But the only thing he's saying that we should be careful for is how we obey and how we walk through and navigate this. Be careful in this part. But when it comes to proclaiming what he said to do, be brave, be courageous, be bold. But be careful that you do study the word of God and you know what God is saying and that you actually are obedient. Well, the law back then, like today, is what we call Christian instruction. Yes, we're not bound to the law of the Old Testament. We have this, this grace age. But you can look at it as Christian instruction. God has spoken still in the New Testament with all these commands and the, the joy of living in grace in Him, what it means to be a follower of Christ. So we walk through that. Well, friends, as I was just thinking today, this morning driving here, is I hope we're meditating on this day and night. Day and night. This is every seven days, meditate on this and think on this. If you think about the parallel with food, if you're like, you know, I'm going to go six days without eating, so today I'm just going to eat like six casseroles, eight hamburgers, I'm going to drink a milkshake, and then that will satisfy me for the other six days. You'd have some serious, serious health complications if that's how you lived your life. Yet yeah, in the church today, we see so much weakness with the church because I think there's a dependency on the spoon feeding from a pastor on Sunday morning. And the people leave, they don't go to the Word of God, and the rest of the week they're starving. We have all these Christians with ribs showing that are frail and barely even making it on fumes. We, we wonder why it's because they're not digesting the Word of God. It starts here with the Word of God. Well, friends, as we look at this as war, as Joshua's called the war, this last week I was really convicted. Sometimes it helps to know, and for you hunters, you fishermen, whatever you do, you have to think about the thing you're hunting. If you're hunting deer, you think about, well, if I was a deer, where would I go? If you're fishing, well, if I was a fish, where would I be? Well, fans of C.S. Lewis, I've talked about this, and I should talk about this every Sunday, but the, the book, the play, it should be a movie, maybe it is, but the screw tape letters give this perspective of the underworld and the above world. And the enemy's tactics to get us as the believers to just kind of, you know, wander away. And I mentioned this before, but today I don't think he's using pentagrams and bloody goats. I'll just be honest. If you think how the enemy works, if I were the enemy to get you to stray away from your faith, I would invent some sort of device that could be in your pocket that would lure you away. Other apps that are intriguing. A screen that would just kind of pull you a little bit away. And now the national average of screen time for, for at least for, for students, teenagers, it's about nine hours a day looking at a screen. It's captivating. It's like candy. This little string out there just pulling, slowly pulling. Dependencies created. There are actually rehab clinics around, I'm sure the globe, but in the States, I know some out in, in Seattle that deal with people that have internet addiction. And not just for looking up inappropriate things on the internet, just the internet. They don't have their phone and they actually have withdrawals that they can't check those notifications. Well, friends, we have to think about the enemy. Are we distracted by what God has called us to do? And he says this, he says, you'll be, pro you'll be prosperous and successful. You'll be successful as a Christian. Maybe some this morning, I know there's a lot of people on stages with fancy labels behind their names and suit and ties yelling that you will be prosperous, that you'll be successful in the world's eyes. That is not what God is talking about. We know in the New Testament, you will suffer if you follow Jesus. It's going to be a bumpy road. Look at the, the apostles, look at those who are martyred. Because of their faith, they had horrible lives. So to prosper and be successful means that you will do what God has promised that he will do. So Joshua, be obedient. You'll have success entering them into the promised land. For us today, it's the rewards of being a follower of Jesus. Yes, there are eternal rewards. The rewards now are peace. It's a promise. He will give you peace and understanding. If you give your life to Jesus, he will give you peace. Well, friends, let's look at verse 9 real quick. He says, have I not commanded you? He says this again. That's when you know. Be strong and courageous. 
Do not be afraid. That's the toughest one for me. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Church, same God today for you. He'll be with you wherever you go. Verse 10. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. It says this in verse 12. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, The Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Now these tribes that would assist, they had actually been established on the east side of the Jordan. They'd already made their camp there, but they, yes, they wanted to go over and help conquer, and then they said they would come back. And friends, what I love in this is the key word here, what I love, it says rest. Is the word rest there in verse 13. We'll give you rest. Maybe for some of you, you feel like you've been wandering in the wilderness, wandering in the desert. Your life is void of rest, void of peace. You keep trying to climb that corporate ladder chasing the dollar, chasing popularity, whatever that is for you, you will never, ever have rest. It's a never-ending marathon that you're running. But God promises that you will have rest. And for the Israelites, they will finally have a home. They will have land. Well, friends, for the sake of time, I want to skip down to what I call as the dream church. Verse 16 the dream church response to this leader I call Josh. Then they answered Joshua. This is every pastor's dream. Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And whatever you, wherever you send us, we will go. So jealous. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, Whatever you may command them will be put to death. Wow. Only be strong and be courageous. Be strong. Be courageous. Church, on mission church in 2022, be strong and be courageous. Why? Because I do believe that daring and disciple must go together. They should not be separated. It doesn't work that way. There's no progress. It's just part of being a disciple. Well, friends, this morning, I want us to read something together as a proclamation, a declaration, to turn this from what used to be you, you, you. I want to turn this to us today. I want us to read this with passion out loud as a church. If you could please stand this morning. I want us to say this as loud as we can so the people driving on Fontaine Road will turn and look and say, what is up with those people back in the bushes? Well, God's doing something here, friends. I want you to say this as loud as you can. Are you ready? Let's go. I will be strong and very courageous. I will be careful to obey all the law the servant Moses gave us. I will not turn from it to the right or to the left, that I may be successful wherever I go. I will keep this book of the law always on my lips. I will meditate on it day and night so that I may be careful to do everything written in it. Then I will be prosperous and successful. Oh, man, well, friends, you can have a seat. I do hope you live that. That's my prayer this week as us as the staff as we pray for you. Every week we pray for you. We visualize what you're going through. I want you, friends, to live this out. Well, friends... You cannot separate the two. Daring and disciple, they must go together. Well, friends, if you have never given your life to Jesus, then you are not a disciple of Christ. And there's no better morning than this morning, right here, right now, for you to give your life to him and say yes to him and to surrender to him. We will have some church leaders in the back that would love to pray with you. No matter what you're going through, we'd just love to pray with you and go to battle for you. And friends, my one thing I want to challenge you with this week, if you want to figure out how to be a warrior, if you want to figure out how to navigate this and to have your battle buddies, please get in a small group. 
This is the season as they're starting. Make sure to contact Pastor Brandon. As you head out of here, you can go to the welcome desk. They will answer all your questions about the different groups. We have different groups that meet on different nights of the week, um, different groups for whatever different hobbies. I don't even know. There's many different groups. We want to make sure you get in a group because, friends, daring and discipleship, they go together. But you'll get some battle buddies that help you be daring and help you be a disciple at the same time. That's why we do small groups. Well, friends, let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for our new friends that are here today. As I see new faces, it's exciting. God, thank you for healing our people. I know we had so many people who have been sick the last two weeks with this annoying bug, but God, it is what it is. But we still want to see you work through viruses, God. You can help us hit pause sometimes. We need a Sabbath. So thank you so much for these, the bugs that you give us, God. Jesus, I ask that you give people here who have never said yes to you. Give them the boldness to take a step forward and to pray with some church leaders this morning, God. Help them say yes to you. Jesus, help us be bold, God. We want to be daring disciples. Like Jim Elliott, no concerns. No concerns. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And so Jim Elliott is with you for eternity, worshiping you in perfection. And Jesus, I want that with all of us. We want to serve you faithfully, no matter the risk. So God, help us be daring. And Jesus, I pray this in your name. Amen.